we're actually lucky. <laughs> uh, we live in the age of pandemics. Our globalized, urbanized economy is just an invitation to evolution. Uh, we've seen MERS, SARS, H1N1, Ebola, and AIDS. Um, and I think we will see more. Uh, this one was just bad enough to wake us up in the way the other ones have did not. But um, there are many worse out there. Um, the evolution and the virus don't care if one, 10, or 30% of us die from it. It just wants to pass it on. <clears throat> so one with this, this relatively low death rate compared to like cholera, uh, the plague, um, and uh, the other things that have hit us, I think in the end will be, I hope, enough to wake us up. We were shockingly unprepared. The failure here was the failure of our low-level bureaucracy uh, of the World Health Organization, the FDA, the CDC, uh, and, and you don't, you can just begin to think of all the screw-ups uh, that, that kept us from the appropriate response. I don't want to personalize it. It was always thus. It was this way around the world. Uh, only South Korea and uh, Singapore and Taiwan seem to have had a, a reasonable response. It was thus at Pearl Harbor. It was thus in 9-11. <clears throat> well, let this be the lesson to not get caught the next time when a 10% fatality one comes through. The economic lockdown is a panic button. It's the emergency. It's what you do when it's completely gotten out of control. There's a danger, though, that we start to think of this as the normal response because as always, how we fought the last one becomes the new norm. No, this was a preventable disaster. And uh, we have to make sure that the response is to not do this again. How do you fight this right? You fight it early, hard, and fast. You test, you trace, you isolate, you lock down the hotspots. You don't shut down an entire economy. Um, but we, we were not even taking temperatures. Uh, just now we've woken up to find out that we don't have masks. The greatest industrial economy in the world is falling apart because we don't have five cent face masks. This doesn't need a big presidential plan and leadership. This needs a well worked out and oiled low level bureaucracy. The president doesn't sit at the, at the entrance to airports and take your temperature. The key is as always to get the reproduction rate below one, then it dies off. Uh, an important insight is that reproduction rate is not fixed in the virus. It's fixed a lot in human behavior, and it varies tremendously. We don't all have a reproduction rate of two. So the economic key is to stop the people and activities, the, the, huge, the, the small tail of enormously dangerous people and activities, um, not to stop absolutely everything. You, you want to stop the, the things that cause the highest danger at the lowest economic cost. Uh, and we, we've sort of realized that, duh. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what isolating is about. The people who are sick are more likely to, trade, to spread it than the people who are not sick. Uh, group, big group activities, crowded bars and clubs, yeah, that's more dangerous. But that principle needs to be applied more generally. And that's what the detailed test, trace, contact trace, shut down hotspots, put out the embers, standard public health is, is about. Uh, not shut down everything, not decide what's essential and not essential turns out to be about a half, and then we're not really paying that much attention to the essential. They're, they're... Having failed, we've locked everything down, and this is posing an immense and needless economic cost. The longer the lockdown lasts, the more it will be permanent. If you stop everything for one or two weeks, that we could call that the Great Vacation. Uh, you stop, but then everything is prepared to get going right where it was. The problem is that the debt clock does not turn off. And as weeks and months go by, jobs are permanently lost, businesses are permanently shuttered, those productive activities aren't there, and what could be a V-shaped recovery turns into an L-shaped recovery. And even in the V-shaped scenario, there's going to be a big shift in demand for what people want in the future. Uh, what will, the viruses will be with us for a while, and life will be different. So. Um, <clears throat> What we need now to get is to get the economy going. Um, and let's realize this won't end soon. Um, there will be lots of uh, inf uninfected people in the US. There will be a reservoir around the world. The virus is ready to start up again anywhere and, and, until you get a vaccine that vaccines everybody on the planet, which is uh, years away. 
Uh, it's ready to start up, start up again. The U.S. tends to sort of dream of a, a uh, tech will come save us. Every day there will be a cheap test, a vaccine will come. Yes, eventually, but not now. Now, what we need is that component that was missing in January. Uh, the cost is a trillion dollars a month. <laughs> we don't need reopen versus lockdown. We need to reopen smart. We need that combination of an economic and public health plan and the bureaucratic competence to execute it. Uh, testing, tracing, putting out the embers, locking down the hot spots. Uh, it's not something the president does. It's something that has to be done at the local level. Um, macro policies, what we're fighting with now is a river of federal cash. There's this tendency like, like a two-year-old with a hammer, everything looks like a nail and to fight the last war. So we're fighting 2008. We're spending right now uh, two trillion, eventually the forecasts are six trillion of direct borrowing. Um, that all has to be paid back. And it's immensely inefficient. Just as one example, the thousand dollar checks that are going to every citizen. Well, they're going to 60 million social security recipients, those who have government jobs, those who have government pensions. Uh, all our plans have the big disincentives that will slow down the recovery that they had before. As one example, we're paying people more to stay home than they get from working. Uh, reasonable perhaps for a week or two, but not in the fall when you're trying to restart an economy. Our Fed is literally printing up $5 trillion of money to hand it out, propping up prices so that no investor has to take a big loss. And I wonder where is the 2008 populist outrage at this? Well, not now, we're fighting an emergency, but that is and should come. And as usual, there's massive disincentives to all this. If we bail out industrial companies and airlines, like we bailed out the big banks in 2008, really bailing out their stockholders and bondholders, um, does that mean they're allowed to rack up big debts again? Does that mean financial markets are perpetually like a four-year-old on a bicycle needing the Federal Reserve to step in every time prices uh, threaten to go down? Are we going to Dodd-Frank regulate everything in the wake of this? So please, this, this can't go on. <laughs> Um, and we can't wait for our government. We, we at least let's look forward and not wait for the debt crisis to hit the, the U.S. Uh, we have to do things a little bit efficiently and not normalize this as the, as the response. So we got to get through the summer, which needs us to reopen smart. Uh, we need to get through the fall, which means to turn off uh, the, the, the natural ideas of too much stimulus and the policies that keep the economy from going again. And then absolutely next time we need to get ready for the next time uh, we need to fight this next time with a competent public health uh, uh, program not an economic catastrophe 